Good afternoon, everyone. Speaking at the Kuwait International Conference for the Reconstruction of Iraq today, the Secretary General launched the United Nations Recovery and Resilience Program for Iraq, which he said is a two-year program designed to help the Iraqi government fast-track the social dimensions of reconstruction. He added that it aims to make immediate and tangible improvements to people's daily lives, rather than the long timelines associated with major infrastructure projects and economic reforms. The Secretary General said that reconstruction and development programs must go hand in hand with the strategy to prevent the recurrence of violent extremism and terrorism in Iraq. This must include full respect for human rights, including political, civil, economic, social, and cultural rights. He added that he was encouraged to see progress in the baghdad Erbil dialogue and the Secretary General hopes that meetings between the federal government and Kurdistan regional government will continue and resolve outstanding issues. The UN is seeking $482 million for the first year of the Recovery and Resilience Program and an additional $568 million to help stabilize high-risk areas. Separately, partners are seeking $569 million to provide life-saving assistance to 3.4 million highly vulnerable people across Iraq through the 2018 Humanitarian Response Plan. Stefan de Mistura, the Special Envoy for Syria, told the Security Council that since the Vienna and Sochi meetings, he has been consulting on the establishment of a constitutional committee for Syria. His team is in touch with a wide array of Syrians, and he also continues to pursue the convening of Syria talks dealing with all four baskets of issues concerning Syria. He said he will proceed from New York to Munich, where he will consult with the Secretary General and other senior officials present at the Munich Security Conference. Mr. de Mistura warned the Council that we have seen a string of dangerous and worrying escalations, including inside the de-escalation zones, as well as increased military in intervention from multiple sources. He said that this is as dangerous and violent a moment as any that he has seen in his time as Special Envoy. Mr. Demistori intends to speak to you at the stakeout once his discussions with the Security Council have ended. Meanwhile, today, a United Nations Syrian Arab Red Crescent interagency convoy entered Nashabia and besieged eastern Ghouta to deliver food, health, and nutrition items for 7,200 people in need. This is the first interagency convoy to cross conflict lines in 2018 and the first to a besieged area since November 2017. The UN estimates that there are 11,765 people in the Nashabia area and some 393,000 people living throughout besieged eastern Ghouta. Since an escalation of hostilities in mid-November, civilians have endured hundreds of shelling attacks and airstrikes that have reportedly resulted in over 200 deaths and left more than 600 people injured. Over the same period, dozens of mortar shells and rockets have fallen on Damascus neighborhoods and suburbs, reportedly resulting in scores of civilian deaths and injuries. The UN reminds all parties to the conflict in Syria of their responsibility to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure and to facilitate safe, unimpeded, and sustainable access to all in need, particularly those in besieged and hard-to-reach areas as required by international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Aid agencies in Mali today launched the 2018 Humanitarian Response Plan for the country, which is seeking $263 million to provide humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable people. The humanitarian situation in Mali has deteriorated, with insecurity spreading from the north to the central regions. Some 4.1 million people require assistance in 2018, compared to 3.8 million people in 2017. Food insecurity is a particular concern, with more than one in five Malians facing food insecurity this year. Of these people, 795,000 require immediate assistance. The number of children suffering from severe acute malnutrition has also increased by more than 10% between 2017 and 2018. In Johannesburg, the Secretary General's youth envoy, Jahatma Wikramane Yake, spoke at the 8th uh, Africa Conference on Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights. She stressed that youth engagement with the Sustainable Development Goals is critical in the African continent, where many young people, and especially girls and women, continue to suffer severe disadvantages when it comes to health services and education. She noted that despite recent progress, Africa still has the highest levels of teenage pregnancy in the world, many of which occur in the context of child marriage. In the 21st century, she said, we cannot allow for child marriage to happen. And similarly, in the 21st century, we cannot allow for children to give birth to children. This is the last stop of her visit to the continent, and she will be back in New York later this week. It's Valentine's Day, 
Although it is not an international day, we want to bring your attention to two campaigns with this theme. This theme. The UN Environment Program has launched its Are You in a Toxic Relationship campaign, which asks consumers to break up with disposable plastic to help reduce marine litter. And the UN Population Fund is promoting their I Don't campaign, which seeks to raise awareness that although Valentine's Day is celebrated as a romantic time for couples, millions of children are coupled up before they're ready, often against their wills. UNFPA calls on the world to prioritize ending child marriage. More information on these campaigns is available on the agency's websites. And the honor roll has climbed to 50 members with payments from Croatia and Slovenia. Our thanks go to both those member states. And in a short while, I will be joined by Pumzile, Pumzile Mlambo Nguka, the executive director of UN Women. She will be here to brief you on the main conclusions of the flagship report entitled Gender Equality in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And before that happens, you'll also hear from Brendan Verma, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly. Before we get to Brendan, is there any questions? Are there any questions for me? Yes. Thank you, I want to ask about uh, the reconstruction conference in Kuwait. Um, Secretary General was very supportive for this process, and the UN was a sponsor. Uh, but the Iraqi government, before this conference, uh, issued a list of project reconstruction, specific reconstruction pro project throughout Iraq. None of these project was in, in Kurdistan region of Iraq, which is part of Iraq. Um, how, uh, and, and there are some accus accusations in Baghdad by, by parties, political parties, that the selection of those reconstruction process, basically the money that will be collected at that conference, is, is used based on, on more sectarian and political uh, uh, lines uh, with political motivation. What is, is, are you concerned about these, these facts and well, accusations? Too? The UN's recovery and resilience program is intended for all of Iraq, and we want to make sure that all the parts of Iraq that have been affected by conflict will receive reconstruction funds. Regarding uh, the situation uh, uh, between uh, involving Kurdistan and the Kurdistan regional government and the Iraqi government, uh, as, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, the Secretary General was encouraged to see the recent progress in the baghdad Erbil dialogue, and he does hope that meetings between the federal government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government will continue and that they will resolve outstanding issues. One follow-up on that. Uh, Farhan, if you ex explain to me this money that uh, outside of the, that uh, initiative by Secretary General, the money that will be collected at that, pre, uh, at that conference, will the UN help the Iraqi government how to spend it? How, is there any mechanism? Uh, the UN you know? will work with the government of Iraq in terms of uh, devising uh, uh, programs uh, for, for reconstruction. As, as you know, the UN agencies on the ground already uh, are in touch with uh, the federal and local authorities in terms of uh, of humanitarian and rehabilitation projects, and we'll continue to do that. Yes, Errol. By the way, uh, while we're on the subject, we're, we're trying to get all the, the desks fixed. Uh, our, our media accreditation Without? colleagues have, have pointed out the need to, to get those, so, so we're, we're trying to get it all working. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, just uh, to check out, uh, you told me that uh, the Secretary General is uh, regularly briefed on the issue of changing the name of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Mm. When was the last time that SG met Mr. Nimitz, and where? Uh, uh, he, he is, he's always briefed on uh, the work that Mr. Nimitz does, so it's not a, it's not a question of direct meetings uh, with him. But, uh, you know, he, he does meet with him sporadically, but uh, as you know, we put out a note about Mr. Nimitz's work even just yesterday, and, and the Secretary General continues to be apprised of, of his work. Uh, to ask a, just a journalistic question, I mean, did he meet him at all? Or if I missed something, sorry? On, on, on this latest trip, no, the Secretary General is in Kuwait, so, so he did not uh, meet Mr. Nimitz, who's, who's, wor who's working right now out of Vienna. But, but he continues to be apprised of his work, and they uh, continue to, to I be mean, discussion. I did he meet him and how many times since he became a secretary general? I, I wouldn't know how many times, but, but they're, they're in touch, uh, including through, their, uh, through uh, their offices and on the phone, even, even when they don't particularly meet face to face. Thank you. Yes, Masood. Uh, thank you, Farhan. On this uh, situation in Yemen, 
Um, there is a, uh, I mean, the, there was supposed to be the talk, peace talks uh, about to happen. Uh, but do, can you say anything, uh, uh, update on that? And whether the Saudis have been persuaded to allow uh, the medical and, and aid and uh, to the uh, to the Houthis who are surrounded by the uh, Saudi-led coalition? We continue to be in touch uh, with uh, the coalition to try and get more access to Yemen. There has been some access, and we have been able to get some aid in, uh, but, uh, but more needs to be done. And we uh, continue to call for a halt to all fighting and greater humanitarian access. Yes. What's the latest on the uh, uh, Rohingya crisis? Because the Rohingya crisis which is going back to us, and there's no, relent no relenting in the situation over there in, uh, in uh, Myanmar. Can you tell us what that? Well, uh, as, as you may know, uh, the members of the Security Council discussed uh, the situation uh, just, just recently. Um, you know, we uh, continue through our UN team to, uh, uh, to uh, follow the situation of the Rohingya, and we remain prepared to provide necessary assistance towards implementing long-term solutions to the root causes of the crisis in Rakhine State. Yes. Sure. I want to ask you about Egypt and Burundi and then some other things. In, in Egypt, the, the former head of the um, anti-corruption unit, Hesham Gijinena, uh has now been arrested, to put, putting a, joining a long list of possible presidential candidates or their advisors arrested by the CC government. What does the UN think going into this? Uh, what I can say on that is we continue to note with concern reports from Egypt regarding the limited political space in the country, including a number of recent arrests and detentions. We will continue to engage with the authorities on these issues. And speaking of limited political space, in Burundi, there's, uh, the government has used the national radio to say that those campaigning against the upcoming uh, uh, constitutional referendum that would allow Pierre and Kurnziza to remain in power into the 2030s uh, are subject to arrest. And some students have even been arrested in schools for, for campaigning against the referendum while the government campaigns for it. I wanted to know, I know that there, there's still, there's, you know, uh, Mr. Cafando, is the UN, what do they think of that closing of political space? And was you or Stefan able to get an answer from the Deputy Secretary General whether she met with the UNFPA on, on February 8th and whether the issue of funding Pierre Ancornzidis' wife radio station was addressed? Uh, regarding the issue of funding of the ra radio station, uh, I have given you uh, the response from the UN Population Fund. And so that's uh, what uh, they have had to say about all of their various projects uh, involving radio in Africa. Regarding the situation in Burundi, we are concerned about uh, any efforts to close political space, and we continue to call for an, an inclusive and participatory process, and we would be concerned about any restrictions on the freedom of expression uh, and the freedom of uh, uh, peaceful assembly. All right. I, I mean, I, my only thought is I just, it seems like this is the type of radio station that they worked with, so I'm just wondering, it seems like... I, I, was this addressed, I, I and, or just were, did the meeting take I, place I, between as, as, the Deputy Secretary General and UNFPA? As UNFPA made clear, they were working with a number of radio stations, mm -hmm. as, as they do in, in a number of countries, uh, in terms of providing aid for, for radio broadcasts throughout the region. Uh, yes, Joe. Yes, can you give us a breakout of the travel expenditures um, in 2017 and so far this year of the Secretary General, the Deputy Secretary General, and those that accompany them? And uh, also a comparison uh, with the, the expenditures during a comparable period of time uh, by uh, their predecessors. Thank you. Uh, well, those are those will be collated and they will be turned over uh, to the General Assembly. As you know, that we provide uh, to the General Assembly uh, the information about uh, the relevant travel by the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General, and so th that will be available as a document once they get that. Yes. Uh, Farhan, uh, as you know, the, there is a call regarding Kosovo, since the Secretary General is following that issue with his uh, regular reports. There is a, a repeated call for, uh, from Kosovo's side for ANMIC to finish its mission. And uh, I wonder how, what is the latest view of the Secretary General to that issue. And also there is a call from Kosovo side for United States to be involved directly in the negotiation dialogue process between Belgrade and Pristina. So I 
wonder what the Secretary General, what is the view of Secretary General either to, also to that? Well, regarding the need for dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina, we've always encouraged that, and we continue uh, to uh, encourage any such efforts, including uh, th those that are facilitated by uh, the UN mission in Kosovo. Regarding the work of the UN mission, UNMIC, uh, as you know, its mandate is granted to it by the Security Council, and it would be up to the members of the Security Council uh, to make any changes in that mandate. But just to follow up on that, I, I ask specifically, what is the view of Secretary General of the calls for United States to be involved in the negotiation process that is going on under the auspices of European Union? Ultimately, we want all of the, the key uh, countries, including those with influence in the region, to play a part in encouraging dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade. Yes. Sure. sure. I wanted to ask you on, on, on travel. Maybe I misunderstood. I think that there, there is a document out, A72716, that says that the, U, the UN, through Emoja, spent uh, $391 million on travel overall for the year, but it doesn't break out the Secretary General or the Deputy Secretary General. It says that they're authorized to fly first class with eligible family members. So I wanted to ask you, no, one, does that first class, does that cover no matter how, how short the trip? And number two, what are the range of eligible family members? I don't see that in the, in the report, but is it possible to actually get a breakout for each of these two, high, these two top officials rather than the lump sum number? Well, uh, regarding the, the numbers, um, uh, uh, in, including the numbers in that report, the vast majority of trips uh, mentioned in the report are undertaken at economy class, uh, with only 13% for the period under review being business class trips. Regarding uh, the travel of family members, Eligible family are traveled uh, in the designated standard of accommodation on appointment, separation, home leave, and family visits. Uh, regarding the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General, uh, spouses may travel with the Secretary General or the Deputy Secretary General in the designated standard of accommodation on some official travel when they attend with the Secretary General or Deputy on official functions. Right. But and so, so it's just on that. But the first class thing, this covers all, any and all travel by the two officials. Uh, first class, uh, yeah, because of, of security considerations, just, just for those officials. For other officials, by the way, it's, uh, the, the majority of, uh, of these uh, travels are not about uh, first class, but for long travels, uh, they would be business class for, for everyone outside of, secu uh, of uh, the Secretary General and the Deputy who have, as you know, spe special security considerations. Sure. And I, w I wanted to ask you, I'm sure you've seen the, the, the comments by uh, Mr. McLeod, a former UN official of the Emergency, uh, Emergency Office Center, who said that he's given a dossier to Priti Patel of the then of the UK government, saying that up to 60,000 people, it's a very high number, may have been raped by UN staff. And they, I guess my question is, that number is seemed extremely high, but is the UN aware of this dossier? Ms. Patel says that she raised it within the UK government but was rebuffed. What's your response to... to, to Mr. McClough. Well, I, I mean, there, there are a number of erroneous claims that were made uh, by Mr. McLeod. Uh, in particular, uh, the article that he had written suggested that the Convention on the Privileges of Im and Immunities of the United Nations provides immunity in respect of sexual abuse. That's incorrect. There is no immunity for sexual abuse. Uh, we refer cases involving allegations of sexual abuse to the state of nationality of those accused and we follow up regularly, and, and that's always been the case. Regarding the numbers, uh, uh, you would have to ask him how he arrives at his numbers. Uh, as, as far as I'm aware from what we were able to discern, that's not based on a study about the UN, but it's a study based on the idea that 3% of all adult males uh, uh, can, uh, you know, can be guilty of harassment, which, is, uh, which would make it a larger problem for the, than just the UN, it would be a large worldwide problem. And, and you have to see whether that study that he's referring to is accurate or not. In terms of the immunity, is it some, I mean, in 2015 in the Central African Republic, it seems that, that UN staff, there was some problem with them participating in investigations, basically. I don't know if you would call that immunity or not, but they did not immediately uh, come forward. Is that, do you dispute that? Right. Do you think that the UN in 2015 did when, not uh, assert or, or bounce off immunity at all in that case? When we are faced with criminal charges involving uh, sexual exploitation and abuse, we waive immunity. That, that is our policy, and that con that's our consistent policy. Yes. 
Is there any update on the UN AIDS controversy? The reporting indicates it's even worse than earlier stated and that employees, uh, the staff are asked to vouch for the alleged uh, molester. I think Stefan and I have uh, described what information we have received from UNAIDS. Beyond that, you'd need to check with, with UNAIDS themselves on this. Yes. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Does the Secretary General have any comment on the death of Rude Lubbers, the longest serving Netherlands Prime Minister, who was also the head of the UN High Commissioner for refugees and was forced to step down in a sexual harassment scandal. Uh, this is the first I've heard uh, of, of his death. Uh, uh, I, I was not aware of it going into the briefing, so I don't have any official reaction. Obviously, we would express our condolences to his family. Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks a lot. I wanted to, on, on you at the UN AIDS, uh, yesterday Stefan was asked whether it's true. Oh, 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 wait, wait, sorry. Sorry, if sure, the car has no had problem. his hand up for a while. I'm sorry, I forgot about you. If the car. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, as you know, there was a big uh, conference held uh, of mil regional military commanders held in Afghanistan, uh, in Kabul yesterday. How does the UN look at this conference, and was there any UN involvement in that conference? Uh, I'm not aware of whether we had any uh, involvement, but, uh, but we'll check with our mission uh, on that. Yes. Yeah, I'd wanted to know, on, on, on the UNAIDS, uh, uh, Louise Luris case, yesterday uh, I'd asked Stefan whether it's true as reported that the claimant wrote to the Secretary General asking him to take over decision making in the case, and Stefan said he would at least check on that. Did, was that letter received and what, what was the Secretary General's response? Oh, we are checking on that, but we don't have anything to say on that right now. And uh, one more, uh, yes. just, I, just yes. a little bit, I wanted to ask you this, down in, because it may be gone by tomorrow. Down in the 1B basement of the UN, on the I guess it's a, some kind of the hallway between the GA and uh, the Vienna Cafe area, there's a, a display of uh, armaments, of arms sales. It's a, an Indonesian weapons company called Pindad, and they have ads for tanks and machine guns. They have two peacekeepers now covered by a sheet, at least overnight. But I was wondering, I mean, maybe it's up to member states what they do, but given that, that some of these are purely offensive, purely you know, attacking weapons. They're not defensive weapons, like tanks that the UN, I, I don't think, buys. What is, who approved that, and what's the purpose of, of, of marketing weapons inside the United Nations building? Well, uh, as always, uh, regarding exhibits that are sponsored by member states, you would have to ask, uh, check with the member states about the exhibit. That, that, that's the responsibility of the member state. Come on up, Brendan.